Um, thank you for coming um, and hope you all had a good lunch. Uh, I'm going to talk today about monoliths and microservices inside criminal justice. Uh, I'm Stephen Shudrick. Um, I work in digital services inside the Ministry of Justice and uh, I'm an architect. But <laughs> I don't wear a suit, I don't do TOGAF, um, and I'm really a developer. I spent my whole life writing code, really. And uh, it's only in the last few years I've become an architect. In fact, when I went to join the Ministry of Justice, uh, I didn't even apply for the architect position. I just turned up and said, I don't know. And I happened to have some whiteboard pens with me. And then they just made me an architect. <laughs> but um, what I actually believe, because I'm always really suspicious of architects, because they tend to tell you how to do things, is that uh, it's really the, uh, the delivery team who are all architects. Every day, a uh, people inside the delivery team, whether you're a developer, a product manager, um, a designer, you make decisions about how you build your software. And uh, even if you're uh, a technical business manager, you're an architect. So we're all architects, really. And I think I'm just here to help people, help remove barriers, basically, uh, to help delivery teams work. So um, I want to talk about criminal justice. And criminal justice is actually really big. There's an awful lot going on in criminal justice. It's um, made up of quite a few different departments, agencies and arm-length arm length body, bodies. Uh, you've got right at the front, um, the citizen facing front line and the police. And then you've got the Home Office get involved. You've got the Crown Prosecution Service before you even get to the Ministry of Justice. And then the Ministry of Justice itself is made up of principally these, these uh, four or five main agencies such as HMCTS, that's the court system, uh, the Legal Aid Agency, if you need uh, an advocate, and the uh, National Offender Management Service, if you um, prisons and probation. But there's quite a lot of other things going on as well. There's central services, such as digital and technology, where I work. Uh, there's a legal community, um, judiciary, and it goes on and on and on. But these are these these areas here are to make up the core criminal justice as government sees it. Uh, it's quite interesting because there are quite a few agencies here and they all are quite siloed in how they work and how their IT systems work. They're, they're pretty independent, but they actually need to work together quite closely. And what tends to happen is the whole process, and we can even ignore IT here, but the process of criminal justice is this idea of almost passing a baton down the line or a relay race. It's... Uh, the police, once they're finished, they pass the baton to the, uh, the Crown Prosecution and then to the courts and then to the prison and then to probation. Um, and then it might go round again uh, if the um, person ends up reoffending or gets picked up by the police again. So we've got a real challenge inside criminal justice because we have uh, uh, so, so many departments that are quite independent. I mean, inside the Ministry of Justice, there's, I think, 75,000 staff on their own, so it's pretty big. But this is not really how citizens see criminal justice. This map that is quite hard to read <laughs> and quite complicated is actually based on research where we went out and spoke to the citizens and asked them, how do you view criminal justice? And they don't see police and CPS and the court system necessarily. They just know that they're involved in the process. They maybe have to turn up the court and... Um, if the, they find it confusing that it's not particularly joined up, they, they see services that span across all these different departments. And uh, you, so this, you could kind of map some of these areas here. You can see on the left, you can't really read it, but you've got on the left, you've got reporting and prevention of crime. In the middle, you've got uh, uh, turning up to court, judgments and sentencing. And on the right, you kind of have uh, uh, ended up in prison, but you might might be fined or you might be on a course of rehabilitation. So um, this is a real challenge for us uh, inside digital services where we want to actually build uh, really meaningful digital experiences um, and IT solutions because there are so many different, different departments at play here. So <laughs> that gets us onto the subject of government IT. Um, how do we all think, view government IT? When you think of govern, government IT, what jumps into your head? I mean, please shout out some things. I mean, it's all been on the news yesterday with a, with a register to the EU referendum. But, but what, what do you think of when uh, you think of government IT? Well, normally late, inadequate. Shout it out. 
UK, let's go to the UK, but probably it's the same in the US and Europe. Expensive, Expensive yeah. Outsourced. Outsourced, yeah, that's a really good one. Bureaucratic, Bureaucratic definitely. Slow. Slow. Um, yeah, I mean, the next government IT disaster, <laughs> late, delayed, shocking, onerous, all these things. You can go on and on and on. Um, and it's true. It is really expensive. And... Um, I really, really want to change this. That's, that's effectively what my job is, and that's what we want to do in digital services. And what I want to talk about today is why this happens. And I want to just talk through a, an example when we tried to build something. And I also want to talk about what we're actually doing to stop it, and how we're, we're using architecture, how we're using principles. Um, and uh, I also believe that the issues we face in government are also issues you might see in large organizations. I've worked at small startups and really big international organizations, and definitely in the big organizations, I see similar problems there um, with silo departments, probably may, might be many acquisitions and so on. So you might be able to take some of the approaches we think are working for us so far and be able to use them inside, inside your organization. So I want to actually talk about a new service we started to build a couple of years ago, just to set the scene. Um, it's, uh, it's called Make a Plea. So it's quite interesting. It's like, it's kind of like a digital courtroom. It's like, what if I could go online and plead guilty or not guilty to uh, um, an offence rather than turning up in court? So we, in, the pilot, the, the, alpha, the alpha we built initially was for motoring offences. Um, so what, I just want to set the scene of actually what that really, really means is that the typical scenario is you've been caught speeding probably by a speed camera. Um, <laughs> the um, police have sent you, a, um, you've been sent a, a fine in the post, you have to pay it, uh, but you might not have the right address because you haven't informed the DVLA that you've moved or you might not open your, your mail or you might not want to pay it or you might be really disorganised or moving house. Um, or you might not be able to afford to pay it. Um, and so all these reasons mean that eventually the police and contact the court and they issue a summons saying you have to come to court and uh, get this fine paid. Um, so suddenly the citizen, you've suddenly got something in the post from the court that says you've got to turn up in a month's time and you've got to defend yourself. Um, so from the citizen's point of view, this is really overwhelming and it's sudden they might not have they don't really know what they're supposed to do at this point. Um, so their options are they can turn up in court, they could not turn up in court, and the judgment would be made in their absence. Um, they could fill in a paper form, which is really weird. This paper form goes out with the summons, and it's really complicated. And they could fill that in and, and make a plea remotely over the post, but, but no one ever really understands how to fill the form in because it's really confusing. And if they do fill it in, they mostly fill it in incorrectly. So people end up turning up to court, and they don't really know if they need uh, um, a representation. They don't really know what's going on. So what we wanted to do with this service was to give the users an option of uh, going to this online service. So what we ended up is we sent them this yellow insert that goes with the summons. And we trialed this in Manchester, by the way. And uh, it basically said, hey, you can go, go to this uh, Make a Plea site and you can... Uh, you can, so you can enter guilty or not guilty. And um, what we found is the majority of, of defendants actually wanted to plead guilty and wanted to get out of the process as quickly as possible and as painlessly as possible. And they certainly, if it's a traffic offence, they might have committed it in Manchester, but they might live in Sussex and then really want to go to the Manchester court and take a day or two off work. So we ended up building this really simple app. It's, it was actually a Python app um, deployed in the public cloud. And it really all it is is a digitization of that form, but redesigned to be a bit more friendly. So the citizen comes in, they enter the, the unique reference number they get in the post for the uh, summons, they enter the date of the court hearing, and then it uh, asks them to enter their um, offenses. Um, effectively, it's gathering data from the user. The user basically declares everything. Um, uh, and then they plea guilty or not guilty against those offences and then maybe enter mitigating circumstances. They have the option of entering in financial information as well so that that can take into consideration when, if a fine is given. 
80, 85 percent, I think, uh, of, of defendants using this service in our trial ended up pleading guilty. Um, and it's also we found is that because these are very straightforward cases and there's normally very hard proof that there's normally a photo of someone in the car and someone's registered to that car that there's a very predictable outcome um 98 percent or something are found guilty and are given probably a hundred pound fine or something along those lines um so it's it, it's it's a very straightforward case and it works for the citizen because it makes it makes the, makes it easier for them to interact with justice, um, and it's somewhere they can go to find out about what to do next and explain explain things to them. But it also, let's be honest here, it does save uh, government money as well because we don't have to assemble a courtroom uh, and uh, hear a large number of really straightforward cases. We can concentrate on uh, more complex, more important cases. So it was a trial to find out how this would work, and it ended up being quite successful. And as it was quite successful, the ministers went, oh, great, this is brilliant, let's roll it out na nationally. So, so far, from a technical point of view, we've built a really simple service. It only took a few months, and we had great success. It hasn't cost that much money. This is kind of now where things start going wrong. <laughs> um, so, we want to roll it out nationally. Uh, the trouble is that the UK is quite devolved in terms of the police force and the... Um, and the courts. So we want to ro roll it out region by region. And then we find out that, that the way the courts work in each, each region is slightly different. So that means we've got to change our software because at the, at the moment it sends an email to the court. I think it's very straightforward. But that doesn't necessarily work for each court. The police are difficult as well because they have different IT systems in each region. There are 42 effective different, um, uh, police forces and they each have a different IT system. Uh, or these different um, installation of the IT system. Some of them might share the same technology, but there's a mixture out there. And also their processes are completely different as well, um, or different enough that it's, it, we'd have to make changes to our service. The other problem is that the user experience isn't great at the moment, and there's not much very, not really any verification. Um, the user just enters in all their data, but we really want to check, is this really a, um, a, a real prosecution case? Is it a real hearing time? Is, are they pleading against the correct offence? So we need access to a back-end system to do this, because this exists in some back-end system somewhere, or effectively there's some prosecution data somewhere. Um, so our first thing we need to do is look at how can we integrate our new shiny digital service with uh, probably an ancient back-end system we don't really know much about. So this is where we encounter in this sort of first, the first monolith. And uh, this monolith is called Libra. It's, uh, it's probably about 10 or 15 years old. It's had a really complex history. Um, it's basically a large Oracle database secured into a, uh, deployed into a secure hosting environment. It was never designed to talk to the internet. Um, and it's also, the way, best way to des describe it is, is a big Excel spreadsheet. It's just big, lots of tables. There's not much relation between uh, um, uh, relational integrity. Uh, you pretty much can put any data you, you want to. I think you only have to have a name, uh, a unique reference number, and a date of birth, and then there are about 40 other fields which are optional. Um, so it's it's just a, it's just a big Excel spreadsheet at the end of the day um, that happens to be in an Oracle database. It also contains all prosecution data, not just for motoring offences, but everything across the board, everything in for magistrate courts. And you also have to, one thing that's interesting about justice is every case goes to the magistrate court before it goes to the, up to the Crown Court. So there's a lot of reasonably sensitive data in here. Um, it also contains all the judgments, all the results of all the court cases. In fact, when you look at it, it contains everything that the magistrate's uh, staff and courts need to actually do their job. It's, it, it's scheduling, it's, um, <laughs> it's diary management, it's a, a list of courts and places. It just goes on and on and on. There's dozens, if not hundreds, of capabilities inside the system. So it's huge, it's really important, it's quite old, and it's also it's a monolith. It's just one big thing. So, okay, we, we just need to... Let's have a look at what a characteristic of a monolith is, um, because we're going to see a lot more of these in criminal justice. 
And we can kind of ignore the fact that it's, a leg, it's an old system because we actually see modern systems that have been built in the last few years inside criminal justice that are very, very similar. There's a, there's a, there's a tendency to replace your existing legacy system with something a bit newer, um, but follow the same design patterns. So this is how we define a monolith. Uh, it's dozens if not hundreds of capabilities. They're often duplicated between monoliths, so you might have another monolith, another big database in another organisation in criminal justice, or even in the same organisation that has the same, the same functionality, maybe um, notifications or payments or something like that, or money in. Um, or diary management again. You also see a lot of data replicated between these monoliths because they can't talk to other monoliths very easily and they're not designed to and they're designed to put everything in one place. Uh, you end up in another organisation having effectively a copy of the data. And this is effectively that baton being passed down the line early on is actually data being passed down the line and copied every single time. So it's really inefficient. And then, of course, if you copy and copy data, then how, how do you trust the data? How do you, how do you, resolve, how do you resolve that um, those issues? You often have to set software and technology lock-in uh, because it's all, um, in this case, it's all Oracle-based. I think it's PRSQL and stuff like this. Then if you want to build new functionality in, you have to build it into that monolith using that technology. It's another really common thing is you see that it has um, complex contract and change management around it. So it's the monolith has a massive contract. Uh, if you make a change to it, it might take three months of paperwork um, uh, and then another three months of testing just to do a, a small piece of work. And then the ownership of the monolith normally resides with an outsourced team or a single team. Uh, so you, you're going to have to go through this change management through a single group and then it, it, you have problems around priority and uh, uh, prioritising work. So change is infrequent. Uh, security is often the network layer. Uh, so it's, it's, you can't take it out of that um, net, its hosting environment because that's the security layer. Um, and it's tightly coupled because of this to the platform and infrastructure. And it always obeys Conway's law. It's a replication of the communication structures of that organisation. They've taken their processes and turned it in, and basically encapsulated into a database. So we're going to say a monolith is a large, highly coupled software system that's really hard to change. Back to make a plea. So we do need to talk to this thing. Um, and how are we going to do it? Well, could we build an API on this monolith? Well, the answer is no, because of all the previous things on the, on the other slide, we can't make a change. It's really expensive to make a change. It's not designed to talk to the internet. We'd have to change pretty much everything in there uh, to actually expose um, its internal working. Uh, we find, find out that it's got maybe Windows 2003 boxes in there. And of course, if you take the network barrier away, then all these security issues are exposed. So we can't build a direct API on there. It's not, not easily, not without spending a year or two years and spending many, many millions of pounds. So that's, that's a non-starter. We're just not going to go down that route. What else can we do? We can do something nasty. We can extract a subset of the data out, dump the table into XML and export it over SFTP. Apparently that's okay because a contract says you can do that. It's the only way you can get data in and out of this system because the contract was written 10 years ago and we can't change the contract, so we can use SFTP. Oh, okay. So um, we could do that. It's a horrible anti-pattern, but um, it's a tactical working solution to get at some data. So what else can we do? Can we go upstream? Can we go to the source of the data? Well, that's the next thing to look at. So this diagram here shows how the police interact with the court system. And what you see at the top is these regional IT systems. And these are the source of the prosecution data we want to get at. So we want to, if you remember with Make a Plea, what we want to do is actually check if this prosecution case is real. So that information is initially created by the police who are prosecuting in this place. They're initiating the prosecution. So we, we could, in theory, go to this regional IT system. But that doesn't work because it's another monolith, just like Libra. <laughs> Okay, so what's this thing in the middle called CGSC? It's, it's a piece of integration architecture that was built after the monoliths to allow these systems to talk to each other. So what happens is when the police initiate prosecution, they squirt some data into this, this hub in the middle and it squirts it into Libra. 
what actually you're looking at with CGSE is a bunch of XSLT and business logic. When they, when they built this about eight years ago now, they couldn't make any changes to the lead because it was too difficult. They couldn't make changes to the IT system, the police IT systems. So they built this big thing in the middle, this piece of architecture in the middle to try and join them all together. Um, what then happens with this, it very typically happens when you, you, you try to put um, enterprise service buses and similar things uh, into, your, into your architecture is you end up with business logic creeping into it and it gets more and more complex and more complex because you can make changes to this hub. But in the long term, it actually turns into another monolith. Uh, you notice CGSE is not actually owned. It, do it doesn't belong inside HMCTS or to the police. It's in no man's land. And that's because it's kind of designed and built by a committee. So every time we have to make a change to it, we have to get everyone else to agree. So you can also see there's a few other bubbles. There's a few other areas here. We've got CPS and DVLA in the legal aid agency. They also communicate to the, the CGSE as well. And actually, it's, it's, a, it's really complex. There's a lot going on. It's really hard to understand. Um, so... Okay, we're thinking we've got a hub, we've got this integration architecture. It's not, sounds a bit messy, but can we divert the prosecution data before it gets to Libra and send it to our new shiny service? Um, it turns out we can't because yeah, it's another monolith. It's really hard to change. It will take another year and maybe another million pounds to, do, to at least to actually do that. So we're kind of stuck. We've got, we can't just get at this data. We can't, we've got so far with our new service, but we can't, we can't, you can't go any further, and it's really frustrating. So we've got no choice, um, and we talked to suppliers who um, we've outsourced Libra to, and uh, they didn't even build it, actually. They just took on the contract a few <laughs> X number of years ago. And uh, we've basically, the only, ex the only solution we can come up with is this uh, export of uh, prosecution data um, over SFTP, store it into public cloud, and then our new maker please service can pull it out. It's it's not great. Um, then when the citizen enters the plea, it gets emailed to the court, who then rekey it back into Libra. This pattern you will see over and over and over in in government. Um, it's it's the only way we can build new public facing IT services and integrate with legacy because we just can't get at, we can't get at these systems. Uh, just put it in context how difficult it is to get that FTP export it's probably around two, a week of development time inside so Libra and maybe a bit of time to set up an FTP server maybe two weeks it took nine months to deliver that first three months were just change management and paperwork two three weeks of uh, development work um, and then probably few months of testing and then getting it into live and it didn't really work properly because we found out that the um, connection from Libra to uh, the public uh, cloud environment is actually an ISDN line, 64K ISDN line, and we hit our 10 mega day limit quite quickly. Um, so yes, we have eventually solved that problem, but it takes nine months just to do something really, 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 really straightforward. And there's obviously, it's quite expensive as well. So it's frustrating to developers. They've just basically spent the last nine months just battling with this legacy system and maybe putting some new, new, new things in to make a plea, but it's not really moving forward. Business owners and stakeholders are all frustrated. It doesn't look like the, the, the service is moving forward. It's, 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 it hasn't really changed in the last nine months. Um, well, we kind of get it working, and we are able to roll out nationally. Uh, it, it shouldn't be this hard. It, we shouldn't have these problems. So... We got together with the Cabinet Office, with the Home Office and the Ministry of Justice and we carried out a, a discovery, a 12-week piece of work where we just looked across all the IT systems in, in criminal justice and tried to figure out what was going on. We spoke to developers, we spoke to uh, delivery teams, we spoke to users, we spoke to staff, um, we spoke to citizens. And we just saw the same thing over and over again. And we also saw the same pattern being repeated uh, as people built new systems and new programs of work came along. Uh, we needed to do something about this. We needed to fundamentally change this. But it's really hard. You can't, you, you can't just go to the development team and say, hey, developers, just make it work, just integrate. Um, they're, they're stuck. You, they need help. So, we needed, so our way of approaching this is via principles agreed at leadership level. 
And we decided that we needed to get the, our stakeholders, the ministers, the permanent secretaries to really understand why it was so hard to build IT and to come up with some very straightforward principles that people could understand. But if we all stuck to them when we built new software, that this wouldn't happen in the future. So I just want to talk through these principles. The first, one, first set of principles we came up with are data principles. We came up with, well, I'm going to talk through about six of these, but we have eight in, in, in total. They're very straightforward but they're actually transformative. So the first thing we have to decide, the first data principle is let's assign responsibility for data. Let's decide who is responsible for a particular data set. So in this case, a prosecution is maybe, maybe the police should have been responsible for it, maybe it's HMTTS, but we need to decide who owns that data and then they're, they're responsible for it. Um, so, for example, uh, judgments would definitely, um, HMCTS would have a responsibility for that. And we'd assign a data steward, a person or a team, who would be responsible for the integrity of that data. This is very straightforward, but it's something that hasn't really been done before. And then, the data steward, it's their responsibility to provide access to this data and uh, communicate the risks of that, getting access to that data, obviously. But more importantly, and this is the most important, this is the, the most controversial one, is make it free to access. So if, um, say, judgments or prosecution data is owned by HMCTS, um, and everyone agree, in criminal justice agrees that, uh, they, it's their responsibility to provide access to it over, programmatically over an API and not charge for it or not pass on any cost to any consumers. Because in our previous model, we make a plea, it actually cost us hundreds of thousands of pounds to talk to um, Libra um, because we had to do a custom integration for our service. So if another service came along and wanted to get some different set of data or set the same data in Libra, they'd have to pay to engineer another route in. This shouldn't happen. The data should be freely available over an API and the provider of the data incurs the cost by building that API and taking in all the concerns around security and that. But they do it once, and then the dozens of consumers across criminal justice then benefit from that. And this becomes cheaper across, across the whole of the justice space. And this is one of the problems with, with working with many organisations. Um, and of course, then, if they're making it available, then it's their responsibility to make it high quality, and if it isn't, you can go to that data steward and say, your, your data has a problem, can you fix it? What tends to happen at the moment is we go, we go to copies of the data that people store because they can store it. And so you go to um, data stored in a monolith, say, um, prison data, and you, and you say, oh, your list of prisons is, is incorrect, and they go, oh, it's just, a, it's just a copy, we've copied it from somewhere else. And then you... you, you you end up with data conflict. So it's by defining a data steward, it's, it's easier to, uh, to actually control data quality. So also we wanted, oh, I'm a clicker. We also wanted the, the data stewards to design the, the data standards as well. So again, in the CGSE example, that piece of integration architecture, it was designed by a committee and it makes it really hard to challenge because everyone has to agree to it. Um, if one party is responsible for one data set, they're also responsible for that data standard. Okay, so architectural principles alongside our data principles. First of all, what does good look like? Really, really basic, but especially senior stakeholders don't understand what good looks like. And this is a really simple uh, uh, um, uh, chart we've got here. It basically says if it's really high cost and really hard to change, um, really expensive to change and takes a long time, uh, and it also has significant vulnerabilities, it's a liability. And we should identify all our liabilities across uh, criminal justice, and we should fix them, uh, put them as a priority, because they're stopping us building new things. Um, and again, if it's, if it's easy to make change really quickly, and it's, you can make it, um, and it doesn't cost you much money, then that's an exemplar, that's a good service. It's, uh, we've also, this is the first mention of microservices, because we also believe that if, if you build small things, um, small component-based services, then it's easier to, to change them. And uh, we believe the strategy is microservices over monoliths. And this is a deliberate, this is, this is a deliberate reaction to what we saw across criminal justice, which is mostly monoliths and uh, that don't talk to each other. So we didn't arrive at microservices lightly. 
We didn't think, hey, microservices is a new buzzword. Let's, let's just see what it looks like across criminal justice. We actually looked for the evidence. We looked for all the problems. And we just started to realize that we needed smaller components that communicate over a network that we can change quickly. Um, and we suddenly realized it's, it sounds like microservices. So the next thing we did once we decided that hey, microservices seem like a good fit is we certainly have to communicate this strategy. So I'm just going to play a very short video. Um, We want to move away from expensive, clunky silo systems to cheaper, simpler, interconnected alternatives. Here's a quick demo on how we're going about this. We need to carry out a lot of tasks to run a government service. In the past, we'd start with one component, like a database of prisoners. We'd then add parts on top, like tools to book prison visits, or process payments to prisoners. It gets complex as we add more parts, and some IT systems can have up to 100 parts. We call these big systems monoliths. Make it oh. <laughs> okay, looks like the video's broken. <laughs> you don't need to know about it, we we'll skip it. So basically what we're saying is... <laughs> I knew that would happen. <laughs> Dangers of videos. Um, Basically, what we're trying to do is uh, communicate what the strategy is and why it's important. And uh, because it's not just enough to go to a development team and say, microservices is a strategy, go and build microservices. And they just hit blockers all the way. They're just banging their head against the wall. They won't be able to do it. The business won't let them do it because they won't understand it. Um, and if you can get communicate the strategy out to in a very simple, clear, concise way that... Uh, the, the business can understand, then suddenly everyone's on board, everyone understands why you're trying to, trying to do the things you want to do. Because when we look back at Make a Plea, one of the things we tried to do when we tried to integrate with Lever is we said, well, why can't we just get the police when they prosecute just to send uh, the prosecution data to a new micro, to a service we're going to build for prosecution, the whole prosecution data, this bypass everything completely is build a brand new digital route away from legacy but the business didn't really understand why we would want to do that the libra system was too important to them they didn't want to divert away from it and they didn't understand why we would want to divert away from it so it was very difficult we just didn't get any headway on that um, so let's quickly go back to how we define the microsoft you've probably seen this everywhere but it's obviously a small a software system that does one thing and does it well. It's obviously small. Definition of small is completely up to you. Our definition is something you can rewrite in a month or so. Some people might might be less, some people might be more, but um, that's our definition. It should encapsulate a domain concept. So I've used sign up journey as an example. And it should encapsulate what changes frequently. So this is quite interesting because a domain concept, say you've built a website and you've got a sign-up um, uh, for your website, you're probably always going to have a sign-up for it. It's not going, that functionality, that capability is probably not going to change. But the way you sign up will change frequently as you try different, ta different tactics to get, um, get a greater conversion rates. So your microservice should um, be divided over things that change infrequently, such as your capabilities, but encapsulate what does change frequently to allow you to be agile and allow you to experiment, um, and allow you to continuously evolve your code and your user experience. Okay, commu microservices communicate each with each other over the network. We are saying REST. Um, that's our decision because we've got so We've got so many organizations, we've got so many microservices you want to build, probably thousands, that uh, by using REST, we can basically uh, make it independent of language and framework. So people can just choose whatever strategy they want to build their microservices. And, but where it interacts with the rest of criminal justice, it should be over a REST API. We have some other more detailed documentation that says your REST API should kind of look like this. But again, it's a one pager. We keep it very simple. And um, so it allows development teams to, to guide them in a certain direction without being overly, overly prescriptive about how to do it. 
Um, obviously, you want to be able to change, deploy, and replace them uh, independently and easily. And that's something we, we, we it's really, really, it's the complete polar opposite of monoliths. So what does this actually look like when you start modeling this up? And why, why is this a benefit for us? So in this model here, we've got just a handful of microservices across different organizations. And the one I want to point to is in the center, you see a service that um, bisects the business area D and B and C. So um, it's, this is important because when we build these microservices, we want to duplicate capabilities across across criminal justice. If someone is going to build a, um, a, a list of prisons, then that's probably the prison service who should build and maintain that. We don't want HMCTS and everyone else to also build a service or capability inside their system that manages prisons and their location and has a whole lot of admin interfaces to control it. It doesn't make any sense. We want, we want the capability to be built once and this this ends up with simply le fewer or less IT across the entire state um, and less duplication of data and and duplication of capabilities so this yeah so basically we want composability over all in one systems that allow us to um, have this agility we want cooperative architecture over siloed architecture and data services over databases. So in that example of that um, prison microservice, the, it's accessed, managed over an API. We don't want people to build databases and, and interact directly with databases. This is what happens, especially with monoliths, because it's easy to do. Um, so it's a bit more work. It's definitely a lot more work when you're building services, because you have to build more uh, interaction layers. But the payoff across a bigger architecture, is, we believe, is massive. <laughs> So we're also going to say, in our architectural principles, that we want dumb pipes and intelligent endpoints. So we want to be very careful about middleware and having business logic in middleware. We actually want the business logic to exist in the service itself. Um, and uh, if we are going to use any kind of uh, uh, event bus or anything like that, it's absolutely fine, but keep it really simple and have it do as little as possible it's just message transport queuing and stuff like that let's do things you can buy don't in, don't put intelligence into it because that should exist in inside each service there might end up being a little bit of code duplication um, if you do this but that's not a massive problem so for example if you're consuming a set of microservices to figure out who a prisoner is uh, which prison they're in and uh, maybe if they're a risk of sort of self-harm or something like that. But this probably happens quite a lot. There's probably a number of services you're going to build that need to ask these questions across a set of different services. So you probably end up going to write a lot of similar code that calls to a microservice, pulls some data in and aggregates it together. Uh, now, you might write another service that does a very similar thing and another one that does a very similar thing. It's okay, in our opinion, if there's a bit of code duplication here. We'd hope that the teams, when they are building this software, will think, hey, actually, we are doing the same thing. Maybe we should share some code. Or maybe if we're continually aggregating the same data in the same way, maybe it makes sense at some point to put a service or some kind of middleware um, that actually does this aggregation for us as a service. It's... Um, but uh, I think that this actually has a pattern. I think it's called backends for frontends, where uh, you decide that actually there's a lot of, lot of network activity going on, there's a lot of chat, and it might, might, might make sense to integrate a set of services via a piece of middleware. But only do this when there's a demonstrable need to do it. Don't start off with that design, iterate towards it. So we're basically saying, try and avoid uh, business logic in middleware as, as, as much as possible. Only do it where you can actually, there's a real, real need. Um, boundaries of responsibility are really important as well. So the, by deciding that a service is owned by um, a particular uh, uh, or part of the organization, then then everything to do with support, monitoring, um, so we talk about data integrity, integrity security, it, it, it's, it's in one domain, it's in one group, it's not a committee. Um, so make it really clear where the boundaries are. Uh, we 
public cloud over private hosting. If we're going to go with microservices, we can't really continue with private data centers that are completely locked down and not and not accessible from the from the internet it actually makes nowadays with uh, we use docker we use salt stack we use cloud formation um, uh, we use a different set of cloud providers we use microsoft we use aws um, i think we use skyscape as well so it doesn't really matter which cloud provider we use in criminal justice but the point is we believe the cloud over a private data center because it gives you that agility and it is, makes it easier for it to be uh, available over the network. So this is another big difficult thing for, for, for to change. So for example, when we initially built Make a Plea, we had a lot of pressure to build Make a Plea into the same hosting environment as Libra, which will then pass the same technology and the same contract and it would make it very difficult for us to change it. So we resisted that as much as possible. And at the time, two years ago, public cloud was not something that was really considered inside government. So much has changed over the last two years where we're now saying that, especially inside Ministry of Justice, it, uh, it is the recommended route. If you you have to have a really good reason to put it in a private data center and lock it away. Um, and by default, you should be putting it onto the cloud. And this is one of those things that if without public cloud, without this agreement, it would be very, very difficult for us to build microservices. And it also allows us to tear down and bring up these microservices in minutes. So for example, make a plea, because it's completely automated to build, we can, if it goes down, we can rebuild it in a different uh, availability zone within about 30 minutes. Um, and we can do that completely automated process. So it just gives us so much flexibility. So all these, these these data principles and just the selection of architectural principles I just spoke about, they effectively turn the existing architecture on its head. When you take these really simple things and look at the existing programs of work that are happening across justice, you'll, there's a lot of money being spent right now in justice. There's uh, three quarters of a billion being spent inside CPS and courts. There's around 100 million in, in prisons with digital prisons. Um, and there is significant money in other areas as well. Because they want to, um, there's a real strong um, uh, drive to digitize these services. Uh, partly, honestly, to save money, but they're spending money to save money. And, and just to do a much better, much better service for users. But it turns things on its head because um, we see so many uh, strategies where. Um, you see data being transferred from one organization to another and they, they, people build APIs to receive data once. So a good example of this would be the police and the CPS. When the police initiate a prosecution, they say, we've got this case, this is all the evidence, this is the offense, this is all the details, let's throw it across to the CPS. And the CPS then look through that data and go, yes, no, we can't prosecute on that, we can prosecute on this, this makes sense. And they then throw it back and say, we want to make these changes, we need more information. So there's a back and forth between these two systems. But what actually happens is because the data is chucked over the fence initially, it ends up being duplicated in two different places. And then when they have this back and forth, they have to manually um, uh, uh, keep these, these, these systems in sync in, in many cases, unless they've a particular police force has managed to uh, negotiate um, a particular API with the CPS that allows them to programmatically change this, and that happens in some cases, but not many. Um, so what we actually want to change that around and say, the police, when they decide they want to prosecute, they're effectively making the prosecution data available, all the evidence and the offences to the CJS, and the CJS can come along much like going to a market store and saying, well, I just have some of that, or some have some of that. I can store it on my servers if I want to, but I know where the defaultive source is. And when I disagree with something or want to challenge it, I change it at, that, at, that, at the, the source. It's a bit like collaborating on Google Documents. It's exactly the same thing. In the past, we'd make copies of uh, docs, and, docs and send back and forth to each other. Google Docs allows us to collaborate in one place. We want to have the same model across, across our services in justice. So this really exposes gaps in organizational structure and funding, because if we decide the police should be building APIs and responsible for uh, uh, um, storing and, and be afforded to source safer evidence, what if they don't have uh, an IT funding? What if they don't have an IT capability? Um, then they can't do it. They just they are unable to build these services. And it's the same with other parts of justice. Uh, you end up a lot of money being spent in some departments and almost no money being spent elsewhere. And what that 
you have this really weird anti-pattern when this happens, where um, uh, because a certain department has a lot of money to spend, they build IT on behalf of other departments. So this really changes that. It, it, means, it means the leaders, the ministers, and the permanent secretaries in the Treasury can, if they choose to, if they want to support these principles, then redirect funding and change organisational structure. And that is truly transformational. And it doesn't necessarily mean spending more money, it means moving, reallocating it. So what are the benefits of uh, we're going to see injustice for going down this route? It's all the things you know we've talked about. Easier to change, fewer duplicated capabilities, integration will be easier and cheaper, um, and we only duplicate data when we need to just for cashing. So obviously no silver bullet. There's an awful lot of work to be done, and there's a whole bunch of problems, or, or there's a whole bunch of considerations about when you build microservices that um, I really recommend Sam Newman's book on microservices. He works with ThoughtWorks, and he goes through it in a lot of detail about uh, the real experiences of building microservices and what to be aware of. I'm not going to go through that today. I haven't got time, but really recommend reading it. Um, so I quickly want to go back to make a plea now, because now we've got these data principles in place and the architectural principles, and everyone agrees that that's the right thing to do. We're able to go back to the service and do it properly. And this actually has been built recently. It's just now in alpha. You can see there's a make a plea bubble in there. Um, that's a, we haven't really changed that, but we've been able to build a supportive source of um, motoring offences or prosecutions regarding motoring offences. We can build a source of pleas. We can build um, uh, notification services, uh, services that handle resulting uh, court orders, and then we can integrate with our fine enforcement <laughs> monolith, which is going to be microservice next. So what you see, that money being spent in HMCTS, we're getting rid of chuck taking chunks out of our big monoliths and slowly turning them into microservices. So this is something we were able to do a complete end-to-end -end digital experience for the user uh, that we couldn't do before, but we can do now because of the data principles and because of the architectural principles and because we, got, we have leadership buy-in, we, we were able to do these things. The developers just got to go ahead and build these things and there's, there's no, it's part of the strategy, there's no one to stop them. So that bit there is a small part of a big picture. We're doing exactly the same thing in the prison service. Uh, we're building uh, services to get money to prisoners, to allow prison visit bookings. Um, we're building a single offender identity service. Um, building a prison register. We're building services to move pe prisoners between prisons safely. Um, so we can understand risks. And all these are microservices hosted in public cloud. And this is going on right, right now. And we've got a bunch of existing monoliths in, inside the prison service that are not not great at all for the, for the staff to use and really expensive and we're slowly chipping away at them figuring out the seams of capabilities and putting them out and microservicing them. Uh, HMCTS and CPS, like I said, there's a big piece of work being, happening right now and a lot of money being spent and uh, it's all microservices um, and these prisons are building microservices differently to HMCTS. They're using HMCTS or Java, um, using Ruby and Rails in a, a prison service in Python. Um, other parts of the business were using Ruby and Rails and some Java in places as well. And they have different strategies. And we're able to, the areas where we do outsource the work, uh, our suppliers can work to these principles. They know that they just need to build REST APIs and conform to these principles, and then it will all fit together. What we haven't done yet is is with our microservices join these, these org parts of these organisations together. When that will happen in the next year or so, and then we'll start to see if it really is working, and hopefully we'll start to really see the benefits of it as well. Um, so what did we learn by going through this process over the last two years? It's, like, it's really important to understand why delivery teams struggle. Um, and it's really important to get down to the actual root of the problem and remove those barriers. Um, developers, architects, we want to, should work together to find best practices. We all do that. We have a community of practice. But um, what we found is that high-level principles, we think of it like as bumper rails on a bowling alley, uh, are really useful and really powerful. And they, they are... You get most, you get buy-in, you get leadership can understand them, and you can, if you're really careful about how you think about them, you can really influence a lot of change. So principles uh, that come from the bottom up work really, really well, and when communicated clearly, you'll get leadership buy-in, and leadership buy-in is absolutely essential. 
if you don't have the people at the top believing in the strategy and, and actually promoting it on your behalf, you will get nowhere. So we have to get the permanent secretaries and the ministers to actually be behind this. Right now, our permanent secretary is, is, is completely behind this, and it's actually these data principles are actually being put uh, to um, the Criminal Justice Board in July, uh, where the ministers will review them and hopefully ratify them. But even if they, even if, I hope they will, but even if they don't, the programmes will work because they are actually adopting them, um, because they can see it's a good idea. And uh, it just we end up all working together. Thank you. That's the end. And if, if you'd like to help us get there, then we are hiring right now. And there's a lot of work going on. And uh, it's really interesting. And it's really good for a really good cause. Gov working for government is really rewarding when we are able to actually able to build things. Thank you. And if anyone wants to ask me any questions, um, I'm going to be outside for the rest of the uh, afternoon i'll probably be upstairs in the seating area somewhere just come and find me and just come and ask me and i'll happily chat and tell you much more detail